first of all, Matthew, I agree. What a fantastic panel before us, 3D printing. Uh, I had to rewrite some of my notes. Um, we're going to try to match that. The only further observation, I always thought that um, 3D printing stands for um, speeding up things. Uh, we are half an hour late now, so <laughs> just an <laughs> observation. <laughs> yeah. So smart cities, it seems that um, there is a new hype appearing on the horizon. The, the figures associated with smart cities are actually spiraling. We're talking about, by now, trillions in terms of costs and savings potentials, uh, basically big, big, big numbers, uh, and they're being circulated uh, everywhere in print and uh, social media. So there's a real <laughs> hype. Um, and uh, there's even talk about the mystical birth of the smart city, the new city. My first comment here is I think we have to be a bit more humble. More humble because, uh, well, who would actually, who would actually dare to say that uh, we are the first to really think, think smart? Uh, who would dare to actually um, deny the Romans the admiration for the sanitary systems they have built? I first had a really nice photo, I actually picture painting with Rubens women in a vase there, but I was advised to do it a bit more decent. So um, <laughs> any, any guess where this is? Excellent. Well, I would have expected this being here in London that you know your sort of neighborhood. It is Bath, and uh, I think uh, what the Romans built back then then had been forgotten for quite some time. Uh, we should remember that. They invented the cement um, on the back of Pozzolano, and that enabled them to build roads and conquer half of Europe, or most of Europe, actually, uh, even here to Great Britain. Um, and uh, it enabled them to really... Uh, really set up new rules for trade. And also, in fact, in my world, referring back to my world, um, they enabled news to travel much faster. Uh, one says about 800 kilometers in 24 days because they had a sophisticated system of couriers back on their invention that they big, did back then. Back then. Um, Damascus, what a jewel. What fascination about this city that uh, is at the crossroads between East and West that combines so many aspects uh, of Hellenistic culture, uh, Byzantine, of course, uh, and uh, a mix of the crossroads that they have managed to, to um, actually keep until today. And then just one that uh, probably in the context of uh, one of the previous speakers, uh, I like the most, Cusco. Um, what fascinating architecture without any cement, walls, and uh, infrastructures that they built many, many thousand years ago, um, that while the city in the background crumbled and the earthquake still stands today. Yeah? And I was, so if, if you look at the details of these walls, it looks very similar to what we've seen just from the Rolls Royce uh, slides, this very fine manufacturing and here, and here building, fascinating. So all that happened long time before us. And I think uh, we need to remember that actually the challenges back then are no different. We're not different from, uh, from today. We do want to improve transportation. We are concerned about water. We're concerned about energy. Uh, that was the same back then. Uh, back then, we wanted to govern and actually be there for the citizens. So, so that for the good of the citizens, people invented and built new city structures that I would say even then were in a certain way very smart. So with that in mind, um, I think it's fair to remember that we've gone through a couple of urban revolutions, the first one probably really all the way back when our ancestors decided to, to move um, from nomadic existence to settle down and, and create a surplus um, in food. Now, now I'm going to get back to surplus uh, a bit later when we talk about today's smart cities. Yeah? Surplus and food enable them to together to stay in a place and then start trading and governing and innovating. Yeah? And then, of course, of course, as you would expect in that series, uh, me to mention uh, the industrial revolutions that really changed the picture of our cities. Um, and uh, first, um, by, by changing the manufacturing, uh, enabling uh, richness, was, which was really fantastic, but on the backside of that, the, the, the shape and the face of the cities changed dramatically. Uh, people's moved, people moved into cities and the cities couldn't cope with that. In the UK, I think the population 
between 1700 and, and 1800 doubled from 5 to 10 million. To 1850, it's doubled, well, it, it rose to 15 million. And cities such as Bath, uh, as, as, no, it wasn't Bath, it was another city, actually one city uh, close to, to London, doubled its population uh, in about 30 years, with people actually coming from, from the surroundings and not finding the place. The cities didn't cope. Uh, so the back-to-back -back housing was uh, invented. And uh, I dare to now quote um, Oliver what happened in London. Although Oliver had enough to occupy this, his attention and keeping sight of his leader, he could not help bestowing a few hasty glances on either side of the way as he passed along. A dirtier and more wretched place he had never seen. That was London. Well done, London. <laughs> Has improved a lot since then. No, but the point here is that um, these changes, these revolutions, urban revolutions, caused huge problems. And we should remember them um, and um, really take the learnings from what our ancestors did when we now discuss the next urban revolution that I think we have ahead of us. Um, so if we now think, and I now get really to the smart city of today and the challenge uh, I was given to talk about smart cities today, I think there are, um, first of all, there's the observation that we again have a huge movement of people. There is uh, the estimation that about 180,000 people per day, per day are moving into cities. Um, and that over the next few years. So a dramatic change that, of course, applies more or less to um, the uh, to to um, to China and India and and places that are sort of in a different cycle in their economical uh, in, um, development. Um, but we have learned hopefully some lessons from our industrial revolution and the cha same challenges we had in the West. So shame on us if we do not manage to help in the construction with the smart cities of today and the future by applying some of the learnings of what went wrong and what went well with our ancestors. The challenge in, in the Western world is probably more the surplus. We have a surplus, actually we could call it also waste in our cities, it's enormous. And to unlock that is probably the biggest challenge for us. Yeah? So one of the, well, one of the, the new driver probably in this new urban revolution is information. <laughs> information based on data, the good news is Data is available more than we probably would like to. Yeah? As I would say more, too much uh, data available uh, than too little. The challenge is to turn this data into information that's useful. Putting it together, data sets that uh, can be matched and then be exploited. So you see this funny things happening back and forth. It's uh, basically showing the, the data feeds that you would already today find in every city. It's not only 3G, 4G, it's all the various smart uh, connections along transportation systems. It is uh, along the water system. So there is data en masse. Now, how do we connect these sets of data to, first of all, create intelligent data pools, repositories, and then how do we turn that into information yeah, that is useful and that can be it can be beneficial for our society. I'm taking you to, into an example that we've been doing with some manufacturing, uh, car manufacturing customers. Uh, we've taken the data, open data, yeah, available to everyone from the MOT about car failures in the UK. And <coughs> taking that data and putting it into some clever tools that um, convert your data into information and then visualize it. So the visualization is, I think, the second key here to make it useful. It gives you something like this. It doesn't tell you much yet, but imagine the, um, the CEO of a car brand, because here you have all the cars listed, yeah? and then you have various sources you can, um, you can make um, here, and then you can filter by the reasons for the failures, the breakdowns. And here we have, for instance, filtered brakes. So how many cars of a certain model during a certain time period failed because of their brakes? Now, a car manufacturer should be concerned about that. So if you now, and, and we were surprised that the, the ones that we tested it with are not really familiar with the information. Yeah, they have it sitting somewhere in their, in their, in their data banks, but uh, they weren't available or um, aware of, of this graph. So BMW, as an example, 
um, were surprised, pleased to see that they had comparably low numbers of failures. Each line here represents a model of their brand BMW um, over our failures, and then the correlation was breaks. Imagine now the frustration of the CEO of the company that comes here into play. It's Volkswagen, and some of their models are doing really terrible. This information, surprisingly, was not available, certainly not visualized, to these companies. In the future, they will do this definitely themselves, and they will match it also with information from the social media. They will probably capture the feedback from all of you, what you think about their cars breaking down. And they will take conclusions from that. And maybe a conclusion is actually uh, a few break, breakdowns more with a certain model doesn't matter so much because people are not complaining. So I advise use social media to influence the manufacturers. Uh, so all this is in the make is partly available today. Uh, the data is there. There are tools available to match it, to create information, analytics, and actually to visualize it. And it's being used more and more by companies. I really hope, and I can only advise and, and push with you all, that, that cities will embrace that too. So cities um, have huge numbers of data sets. One of the biggest challenges probably is that these sit in different departments and are not being combined. Yeah. So some of the, I'm going to give a couple of examples um, of what's happening in the space right now um, in the UK. So one reference is to a, pro a program that is government funded largely, but with some, also some private investments, MK Smart. It's Milton Keynes who has taken the lead, a city in, in full vibe, growing economically quite nicely over the last decades, but with a huge challenge if they want to keep up the growth and still reduce their carbon footprint, things have to change. Yeah. And we believe, together with some of the people running this program, that um, the, the potential the surplus that the city has at the moment is there. It just has to be unlocked. Yeah? And that would require, uh, at the basis, analyzing the data better, turning it into information, and then using um, or drawing useful conclusions from that. So one example of the M MK Smart activity um, is, well, uh, first of all, at the, at the core, at the heart of this project sits a huge data hub. Uh, which collects, which allows the different types of data to be put into and then mapped. And then, um, as in simple terms, uh, we apply APIs, um, so, so basically connectors um, that allow usage, easy usage, uh, access and usage of, of the data, which then allows actually other people to play with the data. Uh, that opening up, in, in simple terms, it's actually um, factually not that complicated, um, allows then the, the public or whoever you define as the, as the user community um, to play and innovate with this data. So on the back of this, uh, well, as part of this MK Smart um, project, um, data, for instance, for, well, I have it on the next slide, actually. Um, these are the partners that are participating there. Um, and, uh, and they are working in different domains. They are uh, addressing transportation, energy. Uh, there are also, that's quite a, probably a clever aspect. They have from the very start included um, a, a whole work stream on how to in integrate the, um, the individuals, the, the, uh, uh, the, the people of the city uh, with a, a facility, with a tech hub, an innovation hub where they can participate in the process, learn how to actually deal with data and what data does to us. Yeah. So um, a couple of examples on the back of that. In these projects, um, for instance, we are uh, monitoring in Milton Keynes around the train station, we're monitoring the uh, parking lots. Now, how are they used um, and putting that into data set and taking analysis from that to then advise the city uh, how they should do future planning of parking lots um, to overall save a tremendous amount of money um, to put them in the right space. One parking lot is about 10,000 um, worth, around 10,000 uh, pounds. They're about estimated 10,000 parking lots missing in the future that needs to be addressed now to control um, the, the savings. At the same time, the data that we're collecting from, from, from this uh, parking area uh, will be transformed into digital signage when you enter the area. So big screens that tell you as a driver where your um, free parking lot is. So the people that are normally touring around will find much quicker their parking lot. 
positive impact on carbon footprint, positive impact on probably the costs for, um, for managing the parking lots, and positive impact on the energy level and frustration or less frustration of the driver. Yeah. Gets me to one point. At the moment, one of the barriers probably is that each department in these cities looks at the cost benefit um, ultimately in their own department. What we need to unlock is this thinking and think more holistically across the cities. Uh, and that requires a certain level of, of governance, of policy probably that needs to come into play. With that, I get to my last slide, just some uh, thoughts that I hope we can pick up in a discussion later on. From my point of view, there are probably two elements that uh, will make this uh, use of, of data a success or actually hinder it and slow it down. The first one is as simple as um, the, the simple term of trust. I believe that individuals as well as companies have to, have to trust more what's going to be done with their data to actually make it available and feel comfortable with that. I personally, I don't feel comfortable with my kids sending uh, all sorts of personal data in the various directions that I have no visibility of. I'm concerned about it as an individual. I know that companies we had at earlier are concerned to share data about research. Yeah. Building that trust, building that trust is probably one of the fundamental challenges for us as a society to, to build a um, smart city of the future. The second policy uh, I've mentioned in passing, there's actually a third thought that I want to put into the audience and into the discussion is, how do we make sure that we not only build smart cities, but also smart societies that include the rural areas? Is there a way how we can actually reduce the number of people moving into cities too quickly? Is there a way to, at the same time as we speed up the, uh, the, the intelligent systems in the cities, to also bring that to the rural areas to balance it out and to avoid another sort of industrial revolution period where we go through a really painful phase? I'll leave it with these thoughts, and I think, Volker, hand over to you.